Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 330. I'm your host, Lauren Gray, and as our agenda calls for, one topic within an hour, and we are definitely tackling an interesting one today. Uh, for those that receive our email, which, of course, if you'd like to subscribe, you're more than welcome to. Just send me an email at lauren at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com. And or when you register for the show, you can add your email list to that as well. The topic for today, I mulled over this an awful lot because I was trying to wonder whether I was just being bitter or um, thought that it needs to be discussed in an open forum. And that is how flexible are your strategies and budgets? For The inspiration initially for this topic was due to yet again, another variant, which is creating impact to industry. Um, we are not going to get into the politics of our responses to um, the pandemic, nor are we going to get into the justifications of certain things. We're going to get into the residual impact. When it was first announced of the uh, new variant, um, we saw gas prices change. We saw forecast change. And I know from circles of businesses, there was already a concern going into 2022 as to the optimization or optimistic look of business levels uh, for 2022, at least for the first six months compared to the reality of what they might be. And I, that, you know, that's concerned because of the uh, the initiated rollout of the, of the new variation and the impact on travel and the closures of borders and the changes of criteria for travel and what have you. Let's look at this from our industry side, which is the purpose of the show. And that is hospitality. How did this affect us? Um, we had a mild positive uh, this past month where we did have an increase in staffing, uh, but that was by optics only. Really, in all honesty, we were grossly deficient in our needs for that. Uh, we've talked several times about the, the ability to stop gap that. We talked about how to fix HR with hospitality. We talked about the things that have changed with hospitality for HR. We're really going to talk today about the, the purpose of how flexible are we in our decision-making process going forward. There are three critical components associated with forward projections. Um, budgets, which is the uh, tablet writing stone of what we are financing ourselves on. There is forecasts, which is the modifications, interpretations, and variations associated with more relevant current data in a short spectrum forward as to the impact on what happens. And then we have, of course, the actuals, the reality of what comes from all of this. This is esoterically what we decide on between August and October, our proverbial budget season. Uh, we've had uh, unprecedented, which is a terrible word to continue to use, uh, changes to our economies over these past two years uh, to the point that we really didn't even know what to budget for. We've had discussions on the show about the realities of how to aggregate data how to take um, mathematical data as in the sense of occupancies and ADRs and uh, historical traffic and voice and demand to a market prior to pro the pandemic, take them also during the course of the pandemic, and then try to meld them together mathematically into helping us understand the future of current pandemic engagement and also hopefully optimistically post-pandemic engagement. Uh, we had a high optimism based on the uh, flux of the summer when the Delta variant was the key element to how we impacted our relationship with this, we saw that not only did we have the summer surge that are, is a traditional business cycle for most places, but we had an overwhelming tsunami of surge of demand based on the penned up demand of people feeling comfortable enough to make travel plans for the summer. We responded by maximizing our rates, minimizing our service, and creating a lot of disparity between people's perception of service and our reality of being able to fulfill that. Um, we felt similar to the holiday season. I even had an optimism in thinking that prior to this new pandemic variation rolling out, that we would have a holiday like no other. And I still feel it to be the case. I think people are still going to exercise length of stay options. I still think they're going to exercise the decision to travel, albeit as safe as possible. And I still think we're going to have a great holiday in comparison to last year. We already refer to 19 levels versus this year. We're trying to skip 2020, actually. Uh, and a lot of our mathematical data. We don't try to look over year over year because we'll look like rock stars all the time based on our year over year projections of numbers. So we're trying to balance out perspectives of pre-pandemic to current demands to say, oh, we're doing as close to or similar to 
what we did prior to the pandemic's impact on our business. Here comes the reality of all these things. There are, and we're going to discuss these tools as to things that can help you with your budgetary process in the sense of adaptive dynamic budgeting. And we're going to talk about tools that can help you in your analytic perceptions as to data usage and accumulation. And we're going to talk about forecasting tools in relationship to the usability of this data. We're going to segment between the difference between reports and then analytics. But before we dive into the functionalities of these things, we need to dive into kind of the rotten apple core to the conversation as the politics associated with our daily business cycle. And it is the gorilla in the room. It is the thing that does not get discussed. And to be honest, there's no unbiased person in that discussion to really call out the emperor has no clothes to everybody because everybody's the emperor. Let me explain some of this. We have a hierarchy of multiplicities of responsibilities. In any given hotel, branded or unbranded, branded only adds a more complexity to it, you have an owner, the person that actually owns the deed to uh, the, the, the brick and mortar. Now that can be a bank, it can be a financial institution, it can be an aggregation, it can be a REIT. Um, it could be, but it's an entity and that entity has expectations of its investment. They hire, uh, if they themselves aren't doing it, a management company to facilitate the daily operation of its re of its of its resource, they have invested in this asset uh, for a gainful return. Then you have a management company that is there to be paid to fulfill the revenue generation capability of this brick and mortar business. They represent the operations, in as much as whether they have a. a franchise relationship with a Marriott, a Hilton, a Hyatt, or whatever like this, then you have the brand's contribution to what its expectations are of what it can provide us as, as brand contribution to the success of this brick and mortar establishment. And then you have the staff and the teams that actually facilitate the operation internally. They're usually under the payroll of man the management group that is operating the hotel. And then we have the segmentations of developing uh, separate LLCs so that there's liability code, uh, diminishment, and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of moving segmentations to this. So let's approach it from a financial perspective. We have the creation of budgets. Budgets are universally seen as a chore, as an unnecessary, uh, as a necessary evil, excuse me, not unnecessary, but necessary evil to the process that's required of all the entities in that chain of discussion. The owner of the company, the brick and mortar, um, wants to see what it is determined to be a successful operation. How much is it going to cost to run? How much revenue do we think we're going to do? And how are we planning on doing this? What's the sources of revenue? Uh, what segmentations of revenue are there? What kind of segments of business are we coming from? And what kind of monies are they paying for us to make a, a calculation as to how much revenue that's going to generate for us to determine that against our costs of operating this business. That's a budget. Then we have the forecasting, which is the reality of current circumstances mixed with the anticipation of demand. This is where it gets really fuzzy because budgets are made in a static world. Budgets are made with certain data points, mathematically calculated, now, that's the functional aspect of it. The reality of it is, is a tremendous amount of politics is associated with it. You have the owners needing to get a certain number reached, and you have management owner, uh, organization. They're not going to walk up to owners and say, hey, we're not going to be able to make those numbers. They sometimes will artificially create the number to satisfy the owner's demand only to readjust it in a forecast section. Hey, we didn't know this was going to happen. This happened. This is not going to be there. Obviously, repetitive negativity means that the management company may not be long time and that the owner might hire another management company. But reality of it is there is the politics of making sure that certain satisfactions politically are there. Whether they're real or not is a whole nother perspective. Um, I can honestly tell you from the majority of people I've ever dealt with, most budgets are made to the benefit of the person that puts it on the shelf that says we have a budget. Um, it also means that there is what's called deniable culpability. How can I make the budget, but then have a way to prove that it wasn't my responsibility for its failure of execution 
or our inability to attain it because of unforeseen things. So we purposely, quote unquote, sandbag things. Sandbagging is usually associated with under reporting of revenue of our sources so that we have some margin of success saying, ooh, aren't we rock stars? We said you're going to get 80, but you got 90 instead. You know, that's sandbagging. But there's also sandbagging on deferring responsibilities, of unforeseen circumstances of ways out saying we didn't hit that group goal mark because of X and Y and Z. And you probably already knew about X, Y and Z were just gratis. So in the conversations of budgets, how do they work? Let's just tackle budgets for right now. Budgets are assigned down, um, up or down two ways. Usually what's done is an assigned revenue value has to be attained. We've been told we have to hit this revenue number. Now, that revenue number is either realistic or artificial, mostly artificial. Uh, it comes from the expectations of owners and or what they want to see as margins of success. If we hit this revenue number, we have our margin of net revenue success at this level. We're all happy. We made a great investment and we're doing very well. So that's been usually handed down to management. Management then goes and brings it to the property and says, OK, here's our expectations of your revenue this year. And the property is now obligated to come up with looking at their segmentations of revenue sources and their costs as to how much money they can spend for replacing air conditioners and maintenances and, you know, uh, FF and E's and capital expenses and so forth. How do they create the dynamic cost factors to fit that mold of saying with this much revenue expectation, here's where we think it's going to come from at what rates and what occupancies, what ADA and length of stays and everything else over the course of 12 months forward. Okay. To also, here's how we look at what we're going to contain our costs. We're probably not going to be able to replace all the air conditioners we want to, or we're not going to probably replace all of the FF&E that we wanted to, or we may not be able to hire all the staff that we would want to. These are conditions associated with creating the budget combinations that fall under the operating expenses to keep the margins successful for the revenue that's been attained. Here's where the breakdown happens. It's a dance. Properties... And when I ran properties, we came in with think of theoretically three different budget variations. You had what you would hope you'd get. You'd have what you hope you don't have to settle for. And somewhere in the middle was a middle one that said we both didn't give totally everything we wanted, but we both got enough to do with what we needed to do with. And that's negotiating. Obviously, as a property wanted to go over and uh, of course, everybody wants new stuff. It's easy to sell a hotel that has new stuff in it. So I want to make sure I have those things and I want to have enough staff and I want all these things, but those cost money. And if I can't show proportionate revenue for that, then I can't get those things because I'm dipping into the margins uh, that are for the person that owns the brick and mortar building. So I have to somehow balance that kind of conversation. They, on the other hand, want to say, how can we not have the expenses to maximize our margin of revenue, net revenue? to ourselves. Can we not get any new staff? Can we not get any new ff &E? Can we not get new stuff so that we can actually get better yield against our current expenses to operating the business? That's called burning a business. That's called burning out your property because a lot of companies do that. They are purposely foregoing the necessary components to keep it in, in, in progressively good. And they're just torching the property to burn it down to the point where it's so dilapidated, then they can just sell the asset at that level. And they've by since then gotten their net revenues off of that. We've seen that happen in businesses as well. So it's a combination of one side of the conversation to the other side of the conversation. And unfortunately, there's so many people in the middle that are caught in a blame game. That's the unfortunate part of this, is that a lot of people are looking at how can they structure their component of, this, of, of contribution to a budget build without being held liable for its loss factor. Um, you know you're creating. When a revenue manager had supreme power, uh, they were told they had to make a revenue number. So they went back and they just basically modified revenues based on ADRs or occupancy changes that made those revenue numbers look good on paper. That yes, we can make that number look like it came from these sources. Reality of it is it doesn't happen because lo and behold, forecasts, which is the accumulation of current data, current trends, current demand, like on the books, trending, pacing books coming into your hotel and so forth, aren't matching what you said you were going to do for that month. Case in point, look at what happened with the pandemic. Wow, bottom fell out. Everything that we thought was the world went upside down. And we had the great 
and I'm not saying excuse, but the reality of our business demand disappeared. People were told not to travel. People were told not to go anywhere. People were afraid to go everywhere. So all of a sudden, everybody that we thought was going to show up at our door and pay what we thought they were going to pay to stay as long as we thought they were going to stay didn't. It's easy to point a finger and say, that's why we didn't hit our numbers that month because boom, that's what happened. That unfortunately turns into a methodology with forecasting. Forecasting creates the acid crucible of what a budget was artificially created as. You think of the unreality, the lack of reality for a budget, a static budget being built. In the middle of the previous year, you're trying to take historical data, which means the year before that, or even the year before that, as we have been this year, and saying based on historical data, based on current wish list, throw a dartboard at it mentality, we're assuming we're going to be doing certain revenues on certain days and certain months in a certain way from certain sources 12 months from now, 15 months from now, and that we're going to be accurate in our forecast of that. If anything, this past year and a half or two years has shown us is that we cannot forecast that far ahead. We cannot attain what we're looking at trying to do that far ahead. Yet we're still in this modality of creating annualized budgets. Uh, I'm going through them now as they're being introduced to properties with clients. And it's like, this is your budget. Okay, sure. And let me go over and say that I completely agree with it because I don't. There's no way to say that what you think I'm going to be doing next December is really realistic given how crazy even this December was in November. The weak difference between before what's happening now to what was happening now in just seven days is dramatically different. You're looking at 15 months from now. So no, it's just a pin on the wall that it would exercise a lot of people's time. And if, yes, of course, I understand the implications of the usages of budgets. The, the appraisal could go to the bank and say, this is what we think we're going to do. Everybody, it pretty much, if everybody believes the lie, then it must be the truth is the way it's being acted on is that if, if we take this budget based on what we think is supported evidence of data, historical trends, historical demand, historical whatever, market penetration, market values, market numbers, I know I create those sources of data, okay? Then if the bank believes it to make sure that they have the loan capacity necessary to cover the ups and downs of cash flow, then sure, uh, everyone believes the story, so it must be true. That unfortunately is not the reality of it. And so many businesses have been caught in that fact where the bank has decided, wow, did you sell me something that wasn't true? No, your credit line's gone. No, I'm not gonna go over and keep risking our monies into your program because your program is not matching the numbers you told us that it was going to run at. That's where a lot of companies have gone defunct and other companies have picked up those assets because the ownership of the brick and mortar who does not know how to run a hotel, they didn't buy a hotel to run in most cases. They bought a hotel to invest in it so others would run it for them that they pay are now faced with the decision of, well, we got to get rid of the asset because the asset's not making the money we need. It's now a liability. And that's where you see all this transition of ownership happening between hotels is because they got into that circumstance. They didn't have negative cash flow and they had no reserves to really cover for those changes that they didn't annualized with their budget correctly, which is the whole predication of a conversation today, really. Pardon me while I'm the only one talking, I get to drink coffee. So forecasting is really the comparison of the reality of pace to what you think was going to happen with budget. That unfortunately is still fraught with other concerns. And that is the reality of the amount of data and the type of data that you're getting to make forecasted decisions based on what you think is going to happen. All you're doing is taking from a 12 to 15 month plan and reducing your scope of prognostication to a 90 day plan. Well, as we have seen, same circumstance, same issues. One week can make a world of difference in a world. Our volatility of an in, as an industry is completely our normal now. And we, we went through this probably our new normal and all this other verbiage that we had. It's no longer new normal. It is normal. This is our world of uh, change where now there's regional impacts where because of the changes in the pandemic, where you think you were going to go and what you thought you were going to do for business has changed into, oh, in the news now, we're an area that is of a concern. So now our demand has literally changed overnight. Our cancellations came in a whirlwind because we are now 
a featured area where people are saying, mm, you know what? I don't think I want to go there right now. I want to go someplace else. That happens now overnight. What does that mean for us from budgeting and forecasting point of view? We have to begin to create parameters of highs and lows. We've had this discussion on other shows before. I want to get more of a pencil sharpening point discussion to it today. What does that actually mean? How do you actually do that? How do you create boundaries of operations to know how you react to the highs and the lows that are the volatility of our current world? So going through the old process of budget creation, forecasting for 15 months, forecasting it for 90 days, the reality of it is it comes down to the actualizations. What did we actually do? And we can't trust the actuals to be an indication of future actuals. What I did this past October prior to this new variant of pandemic impact on our industry is completely different than what I'm going to be doing based on the new pandemic's announcement of a new variant. Um, it's a reality. It's going to impact people's perception. Whether it changes the real physicality of people's medical conditions is totally what happens to the impact of people. But us as an industry, we already know that gas prices have changed, spending has changed, travel plans have changed. Just even think about the international market that just opened up in the early part of November. Now, all of a sudden, they've gone from a within 48 hours to get tested to uh, you have to do it within 24 hours. And there's a quarantine requirement. Well, well how does that change? their? If they're only going to come over for a week, their entire week is now spent in quarantine. Do they really still want to come over? I understand my point. And if not, then they have to extend it. And where do they stay under this quarantine period that's considered safe by our standards of requiring the quarantine? And vice versa, when we go to another country, should we have been planning to do that? What are those concerns? So if, if from an industry perspective, I have a hotel on either end. The international travel was a consideration of my market feed that I had forecasted for or even budgeted for. That puts it into question as to whether or not that's still valid. What's the confidence factor that they're actually going to be showing up? And this goes to our internal discussions as to the accumulation of data that's used for these decisions, the, the functional distribution of that data, which is in the reporting the analytics function of it, and the politics of the decisions associated with that data. Those are the three critical, it took me 22 minutes to get to this point discussion. And that is, where first is the data and what data is being pulled? One thing that's been really positive these past 18 months is the um, uh, improvement of technology in the aggregation of data. There are some crazy tools that are pulling some amazing data points together, if done properly. Uh, Awaxo, uh, which is really uh, impressive, um, uh, owox.com. Uh, this one uses uh, Google's BigQuery data system where you can create a lot of despairing data points and put them together. Um, and we've had our discussions on the podcast, especially between business intelligence versus uh, analytics and so forth. So I'm not going to rehash some of those toolkits for it. Um, we've had things like Hexameter we've talked about, which is the ability to scrape data off of certain things to begin to grit data in that's not just our own self-fulfilling data of what's our previous occupancy, what are previous ADRs, what is our previous history of demand from our website's perspective and interest in our market? What's our comp set doing? It's the blind leading the blind when you do comp set analysis like that. It's like, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Oh, did they change their rate? We should change our rate. It's really just an incestuous decision that happens with this comp set comparison of your market because everybody's doing the same guessing game. They're just waiting for somebody to blink across the street going, ah, oh, they changed their rate. Let's change ours. That's not intelligence data. That's not intelligence data uh, analytics. That's responsive reactionary stuff. That's just blinking against somebody else. Well, they offered one this, one we should offer one that. Um, that's not good data. And so we also have the politics of the blame on this. Who takes responsibility for this? Um, you have the corporate people dealing with properties and you have different infrastructures. So you have sometimes the responsibility of the property is to create its strategy. And then you have, and then it's then it's filtered through the perception of corporate to endorse it. And then you have the reverse, which is corporate creates the strategy and it's simply reported to the property of what's being done 
for them and why. And they're, quote, given a voice by saying, do you like this, not like this? Here's the problem with this. And this is getting into the politics of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Neither system works. If the property is responsible for creating its own forecasting, it's going to create whatever appeases the person it's reporting to, flat out. Because by being accurate and truthful, nobody likes bad truth. Meaning if the property reports, it's not going to hit its created budget numbers or its previously forecasted numbers. They are the ones to blame going, why? Why do you people fail? Why did you do this wrong? What's wrong with you people? You're the ones responsible. Why are you telling us bad news? Because the management company has to go tell the ownership, we're not going to do what we said we're going to do. They blame the property saying, well, they totally screwed that up. But they told us they're going to do this. They didn't. You were telling them that they, you had to make an expected revenue number. They are not, they're accurately telling you the truth that they're not going to make that artificial number that you sold ownership or ownership told you that you had to hit. So they've turned into the scapegoat. Guess how many times that happens before it doesn't happen again? Once. Because once they get blamed for failure and jeopardize their stability, okay, they're going to lie to you next time because they don't want to be blamed again. It's a natural human thing. I don't want to be the person that constantly tells you how much you made me do this and I'm just being truthful and telling you it's not going to happen. So now let's reverse the other schedule. The corporate office tells the property what they need to do. The property, feeling segmented, lack of control of what they're doing, in deference does it simply to say, don't blame me. You're the one that said I was going to do this. And the failure is still the same because the property being dictated to, uh, there's no way I can ask a $200 rate when everybody else is $159. And then you get mad at me for no revenue. You're the one that set the rate at $200, not me. And they are no longer the scapegoat, corporate offices. But corporate office blames that they failed to fulfill what we, they were told to do. Somebody ends up getting blamed. Somebody ends up getting terminated potentially and or they get diminished in their value proposition because nobody wants to be the one that is giving the bearer of bad news to the people that told them they were supposed to perform at a certain level, ownership. So because of that, you're dealing with a dysfunctional system. People look for ways to not be blamed. It's like a it's like a bad game of musical chairs. I don't want to be the one caught holding the bag of poop at the end when it doesn't go the way everybody expected it to go. And that's what's happening on a daily basis in our industry. It isn't going the way it's supposed to be going. Now, in reverse, when it goes better than what it was anticipated, you can't get in that chair fast enough. You want to be the person that gets saying, hey, look what I did. I made it better than everybody else. Even though you didn't do anything with it, you want to be the one that was saying, hey, I told you we should have raised those rates. I told you those people were coming in. I told you that group was coming there. You want to be the hero. So it's not that it's just a negative only. It's the fact that people want to be what I call deniable culpability. You're close enough to it to be able to claim success, far enough away from it, from the blast, so you don't get blamed for the disaster. That is the political spectrum that usually goes back in the dialogue back and forth between the corporate property, corporation, the management company, and the property, and vice versa, as well, ownership and management. It goes back and forth as to who to blame. Well, you made you told me you needed those revenue numbers, and I told you it was artificial. Did you really? Show me the email in the memo that says that I asked you something you couldn't provide. You seem to agree with it. You said that it was going to be interesting or hard, but you said you didn't tell me no. And because of that, I believe that you were going to be able to do it. And now you didn't do it. These conversations happen daily in the world of ownership to management, management to property, back and forth. Who is at blame? Because of that, the data is used to be defensive, not offensive strategy, not going towards how can we do this better? If you could take the blame out of the dialogue, you'd find incredible success with people adaptively changing the data and being realistic in its use. Instead, it's being used for ill means in the sense of how can I take this data to prove that I'm not the one to blame? That is literally the first filter that almost everybody in this chain of discussion is using data for, is let me look at the information to show why it's not my fault. It's the pandemic's impact on our industry. Our comp set did this. Our ownership didn't give us the resources we need to do that. I couldn't bring in enough people to do that. It's a constant 
discussion of why I'm not the one to blame for this effect. It's not about how well I can adapt and succeed our business. It's about how well I don't get blamed for what our business did. But heaven forbid, if it's a reverse and it's a positive, look at how much I was able to tell you and do to make sure it was a success. So it's a two-way on that. And that brings us to another point of the discussion. And that is an unique hesitancy I'm seeing in a lot of conversations to not to sugarcoat conversations so that you don't lose resources. And I say this from a variety of clients that I have. The comp- corporate offices are uh, overwhelmed with demand of service. Um, a lot of people are doing multiplicities uh, of jobs in the sense of beyond their normal job description that they were entitled and hired for, they're fulfilling a lot of other roles because their ranks have been thinned for uh, cost savings. Um, and a lack of ability to find qualified people to bring them back in or, or willingness to pay the people to come back in. I wouldn't say there's lack of qualified people. The companies are trying to think that they can still fish in the same water with the same crappy bait, and they're not finding the quality people in their mind for them what they're willing to offer. There's quality people, but you got to pay them for their quality now, and that's been a change in spectrum that hasn't totally hit owners like, oh, well, we'll just offer the same salary we offered before the pandemic. You're not going to get the person qualified that you want to in that role because their value proposition is much higher because the demand is much higher because everybody's looking for that time, same type of quality. You need to pay to get that kind of quality. Well, that goes down the entire food chain to the property as well. So what happens is now is that these corporate people who are burdened with additional responsibilities and are willfully trying to do what they can to keep successful in what they're being asked to do. When they have bad news with the property, regardless of the communication, whether they're the ones that told the property to do something or the property told them what they were doing, they, when they report revenue numbers, strategies, and so forth, don't come at it with a, wow, did that go wrong? You told me we were going to get that group in. That group didn't show the way you said it was going to show, or you felt very strongly that we were going to be able to get that transient retail rate in, and we didn't. And you agreed that you thought that was a great thing to put the rate up there and it didn't work because we didn't get the demand for it. Those conversations aren't happening in the strength that they need to happen at. They're coming into, oh, hey, wow. You know, you mentioned that group, but that didn't really come through. But, you know, we'll take what we can get. We understand that, you know, it's great to just blame the world. Like, well, it must be the pandemic. It must be the fact that Jupiter and, and Neptune are rotating around the sun. Um You know, you don't push hard as saying, it's okay. You know, you basically lied to me, you know, uh, property-wise or whatever, that you said this was going to happen because you forecasted it or you said this was what you felt was going to happen and it didn't. And because of that, um, our numbers didn't hit. But don't worry, we'll keep on moving forward. And why is that conversation type happening? Because they're afraid that if you push too hard, the person's going to be like, screw you, I'm out. You know, I'm tired of getting beaten up for stuff I can't control. I'm done. And next thing you know, that person has more responsibility to take on because they have one less person and they have to go over and, and try to help the gap that was created from that. And you, so you don't push as hard as you should in the conversations because you don't want to go over and jeopardize the fact that that would be one less person should you push. You're willing to accept mediocrity at this point in a strange way as an authoritarian role then you are to accept performance success or demand or expect or help of performance success. And that comes from the fact that we right now are worried more about the blame game than we are about really being responsive to the dynamics of what's happening in our industry. So now I've painted this whole terribly bleak pictures about everything and, and all the stuff that isn't right and shouldn't be right and so forth. Let's talk about the positives of these things. And the positives of these things is we have incredible amount of um, technical logistics and technologies uh, to create insights and perceptions if properly used. If you can scrub the blame component of it and feel that regardless of the failures, there's no blame. It's a matter of, and I've often said this, if you don't care who gets the credit, anything's possible. The same goes if you don't blame, everybody's willing to take risks of success. It doesn't mean that you just do blind, stupid things. It means that you can openly and honestly offer up suggestions without feeling the worry of indictment if it's wrong. That if it's wrong, it was because of consensus of agreement that that seems like a great idea. It's a shared like, well, 
I guess we're all wrong on that. So what do we do about what we now know? That mentality, that cultural mentality is a hard transition to make for people. That requires trust. It requires commitment to the idea. And it, should, it has to be consistent in what your efforts are for it. Um, there are some tools that allow for this dynamic ability. Uh, one of the ones I found that would be uh, incredibly helpful and useful come from the Russell Partnership. They're the people that do the uh, simulation training and so forth. They have a dynamic budgeting forecast toolkit that they use. Um, it's brilliant in its usability of it, actually. Um, but it gives a great example of, and no gaining from that. This is this is a product that I know about, used, and 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 thoroughly respect what it has. Um, this allows you to create uh, adaptive budgets. It doesn't give you parameters like well highs and lows. It means that if you have to readjust your budget, it's not like you did budgets before. We're like, oh crap! If I change that number, then I got to go and change that number. Then I got to go change that number. That number. That number. That number. That number. That number. It does that all for you, where if you start changing certain things, it creates the modifier relationships necessary to modify all the components within the budget that are related to the numbers you have to change, whether it be occupancy, ADRs, operational expenses. No matter where in the strata you make the modification, it co correctly modifies all the related components and more importantly will identify what those variations impact are for you so that when you come back to it saying, because we modified that, we now have to take this out of the equation for our budget because that no longer falls under the parameter of operational validity for us to continue to do. This means we have to change our payroll at this level, or we have to change our ff &E at this level, or we have to change our operational expense at this level. And it keeps track and solid the fact of also the positive impacts when it comes to your fixed overhead expenses and so forth. It gives recommendations of saying, well, if you're really going to do that, you're going to need to have to change your electric bill this way, which means these following things you have to be changed. It's really helpful in very quick adaptive ways of changing your budgetary information. That's a great tool because that means you go from waking up on a Monday morning with the world being a certain way and waking up Tuesday morning with the world being a different way and making that a change in the budget situation. The other component, and this is going slightly negative again to the reality of what the positive would be, and that is the difference between reporting and analytics. Reporting, okay, for lack of a better way, is either exoneration or indictment. Reports either validate what you supposedly said was going to happen, or they indict you for something that you weren't aware of was going to happen. And therefore, you have to now explain your way through why you didn't plan for what actually happened versus the report. So what usually happens with this, and this is going back to the world of statistics, where maybe people say statistics in the, is in the eye of the presenter. And statistics can be made a number that anybody wants. And that is you keep out the data that has the influence on it that doesn't share good light on you, then that goes back to the blame game situation again, versus the honesty of you put the factors, the KPIs, the reporting data sources that are applicable to the decisions that it impacts, leave them in regardless of the results of it, and know that even though it may not be positive or that you were wrong, that you're not under the, the, the scope of of condemnation by everybody is like, who better you than him? Shoot him, shoot him. It's like, whoa, okay, all of us in this. Well, that didn't go this way. And now we're looking back. What the first question is, what did we guess wrong? What did we interpret wrong? And that creates a decision of this was the unexpected factor. This was the unaccounted for factor, or this was the bad interpretation factor. Great. As with all problems, there's two problems to solve. The current one, and the future tense of its repeatability. Those are the two problems that solve. So how, since we can't solve the imminent problem, what we first adjust is how do we make sure we don't misjudge this again in a future tense should the circumstance be the same or similar to. And that comes up to good management, good team collaboration. All those bad examples I gave you of management down to property, property up to management, let's put it into a positive light. Let's say that we're getting great data sources that is shared equitably between management and property. Property's involvement is because the first hand, first person, first experience, they can give insights on real ground, boots on the ground, hands on the keyboard, 
reality that the management company doesn't have by not being at the property. In reverse, the management company can share macro perspectives and aggregate numbers and multiplicities of unit information to show trends or perspectives that the property in its limited perspective, its ecosystem may not have as a perspective. That if they were just told some of the influencing factors that are happening in similar markets, they'll go, oh, that makes perfect sense. That's the piece of the puzzle that's missing. Now I have a better perception of what I think is a better way of doing this. Sharing that collaboration between both ends doesn't change the fact that management might, might still make the final decisions and or make the recommendations of strategy, but now the endorsement value of the property's perspective is much higher because it feels actively engaged in the decision metrics associated with those decisions. They buy in to the reason why their rate is a certain way, the demand threat threshold of length of stays are a certain way, and or the strategy of marketing is in a certain focus. And they actually contribute to that by saying, this is the marketing perspective I think we should have, or these are the demographics I think we should be doing. This is the list of people that we have coming in in a way that I think we should target this feeder market from. They're the resource for those things and an invaluable resource for those things. By the same token, they don't have the facilities nor the means at the property level to create the marketing campaigns for themselves and or the strategies for themselves. That's done at the management level where they can say, okay, now with that, let's do this as a marketing targeted strategy for this property. And also too, this is the rate strategy component of what we're going to be doing for them. And we're going to create the monitoring for this to know that if it does what we think it's going to do, or do we have to come back and make another decision because it's not pacing or directing the way we anticipated that active collaboration between the management and the property, if done in a non-blaming situation is incredible when it works. First-hand experience with that. I can truly tell you that when that dynamic of non-blaming each other and collaboratively trying to interpret the proper content and data, then it goes from reporting to analytics. And from analytics, it goes to action. And action goes into results and measurability. Measurability creates con consistency. Consistency creates performance. When you start doing that trained methodology of what that kind of collaboration of data and information can be, it's a profound impact difference. It goes from what's being done, and I see so much of now, which is deniable culpability, blame exoneration, avoidance of of, 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 of just the drudgery of saying, oh, I got to do a budget. Great. Whatever you say, great. Just as long as I don't have to do it. I hear that so often when a change that requires a lot of ditch digging, heavy lifting, as soon as somebody says, okay, well, that's going to be handed by me. Oh, great. Good. Do it. Even though the person that should be doing it is the one saying, great, you go ahead and do it because ultimately they're the ones that are going to take credit if it's a success and they're going to say, it wasn't me that did it if it's blame issue. That's the part that they're the best person to do that stuff, but they're the least interested in doing it because it's a drudge. How many times have we heard the persistent conversation that properties spend more time chasing down what management is asking them to do for reports than actually doing the work that creates the data for the report to be done? That's that world that lives too much for people, where it's a matter of fulfilling a report or an email response or what have you. I see the rolling out of sales teams going back to the, okay, how are we going to reward our sales teams? And it goes to an old discussion of how much of a carrot can we put on a stick and how far can we make the stick in front of them where we don't have to give them the carrot? That's one perception. The other side is, how can I game the system, work the system so I can get that carrot that they don't think that they gave me close enough, but I can get it because if I do this in a way, if they took that intelligence of how to work with the system and actually just fulfill the demand of what the system was asking for, it would be profoundly, they would get bonuses on top of bonuses. The problem of it is, is that it comes from two sides of distrust. The property from a salespeople said, I don't trust you. You're trying to really give me an incentive. You put the stick five miles out in front of me and it's a little dinky carrot. And the ownership's like, why should I even give you a bonus when you, I'm asking you to do the job that I'm already paying you for? But then again, they're saying, well, let's pay them less because we're going to give them a bonus. They're very much hypocritical about their performance-based metrics. They don't add them as on top of what they think they're already worth. They add it in lieu of what they think they're worth as a means of compensation that they don't give. For any salesperson, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So... For all of that, that's the world of the dynamic changes that have to happen in our industry. We have to have realistic goals. 
that are mutually agreed upon in a way that is understood. And that sometimes requires education at different levels. I have witnessed both from a corporate perspective and a property perspective, people that have high level responsibility, but not a high level of knowledge and awareness of what their role is. They enjoy the title and they enjoy the authority that it gives, but they do not understand the responsibility of their performance requirements. Just because they can make a decision doesn't mean they're qualified to do so. I have seen some incredible people in high level positions that, I mean, from my previous job experiences on that you sit there going, wow, whose cousin are you? I mean, it's a joke, but it's the truth. It's like you sit and look at some of these people going, well, how did they get in that role? Because they don't even understand what they're doing. And a lot of times they're compensated and covered for people around them that are looking to think that if they do the right thing in that that perspective, they're going to be rewarded by giving opportunities in other places. And so they cover for the inefficiencies of somebody they're responsible for. They're pandering to somebody that's not qualified to be in a role. And I'm sorry, I'm calling for what it is. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but I've seen it in very firsthand circumstances of people that are in roles that should not be in it. They do not aware of it. And they're exposed to high level decisions that they're not qualified in making the decisions for. Um, when you add that to the people that are very qualified in their role that are in a subservient position, you get a polarity of, yeah, okay, I have to bring it to a scale that this person understands. And we know what that term is. When they need to do that, they begin to work around that person. The person either knows that they don't aren't qualified or they do know that they're quali- they're not qualified. If they don't know they're not qualified, they'll act accordingly and they're saying, well, okay, that sounds good to me. If they do know that they're not qualified, they're dangerous because that means they're, they're not trusting because they know that everybody that is qualified knows that they're not qualified. And so they're very defensive. And so everything is an attack on them, even if it's not. And they respond accordingly. I know I sound like I'm ranting, but for anybody who's had these firsthand experiences, it makes sense. Uh, you understand how the polarity of people's personalities begin to play into this. You see them in a room. You can read a room and tell when the person is not secure in their role versus when they are qualified in their role or ignorant of their lack of qualifications is just as much of an indicator. Um, these things, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent with that, are influences into how we respond to the changes in our world. These are the things I hope, because of the dramatic changes that we're experiencing in our industry, are going to get purged out of our industry because they can't exist anymore. A company, as much as they want to take care of their family and the cousins, you know, you know well, let's give them the job, even though you can't do much damage. They're losing money because that person is not qualified to be in that role. They might end up saying, you know what, I can't keep that person in. I got to get somebody that knows what they're doing in that role because we can't exist as a business losing that kind of money. And I need somebody in there that can make the money that we need to make in that role. So I hope it does purge out a lot of the people that are the people I'm poorly describing um, that are doing bad decisions. I hope through trial by fire that our industry changes its ways on how we handle sales rewards versus sales compensation. I hope trial by fire, we change this blame game politics of, well, that was your project, Bob. That wasn't my project. If it failed, it was because it was in your court, not my court. Those conversations should be like, damn, Bob, I'm sorry. How can I help? Didn't see that coming. Thought you were, you know, this was this. Why don't we do this? I mean, we just got this kind of piece of data. Maybe that could help you in the future to realize that maybe that's what you needed to use for this. And wait a minute, you got that piece of data. I can use that over here. That gives us a better perception of this. When you get that dynamic, I'm not blaming anybody, but I want to see what we can do to succeed from what we learn from. Now you get successful business operations. Now you get the ability to go over and make better decisions for a lot of things. So I believe I I ground that ax as much as I can. It's down now to a paring knife um, in lots of ways. But it's, it's how you create that flexibility in your strategy, how you create that flexibility in your budget. I mentioned I mentioned the tool that does flexibility for budgets. There is a flexibility of strategies Um, to make a flexible marketing strategy requires highs and lows. You create create conditional variations. If anybody is not familiar with that, this is what we're basing this strategy on. What are the modifying factors for this strategy? X, Y and Z. Okay. if X tanks, how does it affect Y and Z? Okay. how do we respond to that? That gets noted. Okay. Now, if Y fails, how does it affect X and Z? 
How do we respond to it? We file that. If Z fails, how does it reflect X and Y? And what do we do about it? We reflect that. So now we have a parameter, variable one, variable two, variable three, high, low, okay? All three high, this is what happens. All three low, this is what happens. If these two high or these two low, this is what happens, this is what happens. If one is high or low, this is what happens. If I say, you've broken down the conditional variations. So now you have a bubble. Here's the, the lower end bubble, the higher end bubble on all the variables between the three variables. And I'm only being hypothetical and saying the three variables. Knowing what your response would be from each of those variables means that you have a starting point. It isn't a written in stone, this is the only thing to do as best to your intent of having that answer, as it is a starting point of saying, if it is what we think it's going to be, if that were to happen, this is what we thought we would do about it. Is it still valid? Is what is is the conditions changes or is there other conditions that we didn't know about also influencing factors and how do they influence what we thought we were going to respond as? But at least it gives you a starting point. More importantly, it's a reference point to make the change rather than just say, that's well, that didn't then go where we thought to, and it was in your court and it was your fault and not me, but it's you. And then if the company fails, we like, well, I'll go find another job. Meanwhile, the person on the company. Okay, it's out. That doesn't work. And that's unfortunately where a lot of companies are working right now is this, as long as it's better you, not me kind of scenarios. And nobody's really looking at what are the conditions of the highs and the lows for all the things we find important, the KPIs, the key performance indicators. And what do we do if those things modify differently? And let's put some real case example to that. What happens if you turn into this regional reaction, which we said it would be based on what's happening with the pandemic, where your area is now considered a non-travelish area. Like, don't go there because it's not good. What happens? What is your conditional response? Do you pump monies into what you're trying to do to try to drive for like, oh, it's everything's fine. Don't worry about that. Come anyway. Or are you saying, wow, we need to reduce our operating expenses at a certain threshold to this threshold. And to do so means the following things have to happen. By the same token, you can false read information. You can say, well, uh, volume of traffic of interest is high in our market. So why would we change what we're doing when people are still interested in coming? Let's continue to solicit them to show up or just say, you know what? Let's educate them on being aware of us. So when we can be a safe place to return, we have that base of interest to go back to and solicit them to come to our place. These are all ways of business decisions to be made that are not being made to the way that we just described. Um, it is helpful to reconsider how you're doing your business options. It's helpful to reconsider how you're handling your business in the terms of your response to the variables that planned for and unplanned for are the way you handle your business, both budgetary and marketing wise and internal operational uh, strategies and so forth. So. Again, I think I've ground that axe down to a paring knife. Um, I think it's critically important that people, businesses in particular, look at how they create the flexibility in their strategies and their budgets. There are plenty of tools that help with the data collection and interpretation to make those types of strata decisions, creating KPIs of variables. From those variables, create the relationship of those variables changing to create scenarios that you decide what would be your starting point of what you would do given that hypothetical variable coming into play. And that is your guidebook. Your budgets no longer should be your guidebook. Those are pre predetermined 15 month out hypothetical what ifs and how abouts and hopefuls. Those are, that's not a roadmap. Roadmaps are based on how you would respond to what you don't do and don't know in future tenses to maintain the business efficiencies of what your company does. So there you have it. Uh, thank you so very much for your time today. Uh, for those that may not know, we do simulcast. If you're finding us on one of those social media platforms of Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, by all means, please uh, follow and subscribe to us. Our next show next week is you can subscribe to watching to it at bit.ly bit ly forward slash HDM show 331. There we'll register you for next week's show. Uh, we do simulcast also on um uh, TV. We have our own TV channel, which is Hospitality Channel TV. Just simply look on your Roku, your Apple Plus, Apple TV, 
your Amazon TV, Google uh, TV, Google Play uh, for our hospitality channel. And the live, the, this live show is always on the free side of that. It is a subscription service for other content on the other side. Uh, but you can see the show always live each week there. We do recast this show. Uh, for different time zones. We are in 39 countries. We do translate this show in our closed captioning for 11 languages. Um, but we do reset, recast this show on Wednesday, 11.30 a.m. Sydney, Australia time and 11.30 a.m. London time on Wednesday. So we get our EU and APAC friends in there. And although we do have several that watch us on the, on the, the multiple ca castings uh, live. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, we also are on Twitch, which is an amazing channel which you can find on your PlayStation and uh, Xboxes, given that it's Christmas, uh, that you can watch us on Twitch, which is amazing for it. And also, if you have um, Apple, iOS, or Android, we're an app. Hospitality Channel is an app, and you can go watch our show on your mobile phone or tablet, if you would like, or iPad, uh, and equally as well. So with that, we solicit also your feedback. If you have topics that you would like to dis have discussed and or wish to join us, we are being to accumulate our co-host schedule roster. For 2022, um, please reach out to me at Lauren at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com. I welcome and answer all emails and uh, related to it. We also do a podcast, audio podcast every week, one, part of which is a recap of this live show. I'll be recording that shortly here, which is we show number 330. Go figure. Um, which we talk a little bit more in depth about particular technology tools and techniques using those tools in association with the recap of the live show. And that you can find on all podcasts, 39 platforms, actually, including Apple, um, uh, Siri, and Google uh, Assistant, and Alexa on Amazon. Just simply ask them, hey, or okay, whatever platform it is, play the Hospitality Marketing Podcast, and you'll hear our audio podcast. So with that, again, I thank you for the privilege of your time and for all those that have joined us. Uh, and we look forward to speaking to you next Friday at 1130 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. Until then, my name is Lauren Gray. Thank you for the privilege of your time.